What if the Mariners had to form an NBA team, a basketball team, you might ask? It's a good question. One I'm going to answer today, but not immediately this second. Welcome, everyone, to the Chaos Ball Podcast. You clicked on this. You know the title. You know the title of the episode. I don't even know the title of the episode right now. I don't come up with titles before I record. That happens organically afterwards but welcome back thanks for tuning in i'm back it's been a little over a week couldn't record at my usual time last week so this is a tuesday drop a random tuesday drop now we'll see if any news drops uh the tuesday that i upload this there's been a lot of news like on the weekend and like fridays when i have been dropping off-season podcasts so maybe if i drop one On a Tuesday earlier in the week, something big will happen that day instead of waiting for the end of the week. Like, it feels like it has been, like, all offseason. I mean, a world as Chapman just signed with the Pirates. It's uh, bizarre and not something I'm really going to cover, but I wanted to mention it. It happened, like, an hour ago. But welcome back. Thanks for tuning in. Yes, I will be drafting up a Mariners NBA roster because um, I want stuff to talk about and it's been a pretty slow off season. So stick around to hear me talk about what I think uh, six, uh, a five man basketball team for the Mariners would be and what the six man would be as well. I'm going to talk about that to end the show today, but I will talk about baseball. Fine. I'll talk about baseball to start the episode. This one is just, this episode steeped in an off-season sleepy time tea. Like, it's definitely been an off-season. It's definitely been one of the off-seasons in baseball history. I can say that for sure. I don't think it's been the There's been slower off-seasons. I mean, enough stuff has happened. It just felt like once Otani signed, like the floodgates would open, you know? Like, like the Ents in, in Lord of the Rings ripping apart the dam and letting the river Eisen flow freely towards Isengard. That's what I thought would happen. I just watched the Lord of the Rings. Uh, but that's what I thought would happen in this offseason. But no, it's been slow. It's been slow. Uh, is it because of the RSN uncertainty? Is that causing like legitimate payroll question marks or payroll cloudiness in the future? Not necessarily just right now, but maybe teams are a little flustered about their cash flow or their their revenue in the next few years with this RSN business? Or is that being used as an excuse and there's some collusion going on for not signing the top free agents still available? I would guess a little column A, a little column B. I think it's I think it's a little bit of both. I think there is probably legitimate financial question marks to answer from the business side of, of a lot of teams, but I also think that's definitely being used as an excuse to not Toss a bunch of money at uh, at free agents. That's what I that's what I think. But it's been slow. But a couple of things have happened since I last dropped the podcast last Friday. Uh, two relievers have signed to the AL West. That was the big news. Josh Hader just signed to the Houston Astros, and Robert Stevenson, Bob Steve, as I like to call him, signed with the Angels. Bob Steve to the Angels. And uh, what does that mean? I mean, like in a Mariners context, it is rivals signing good bullpen arms, but just painting with a broad brush here, the Angels, I'll touch on the Angels one first. Robert Stevenson gets traded from the Pirates to the Rays last year, started the season quite slow with the Pirates, but track record of like solid relief pitcher, goes to the Rays, and stop me if you've heard this before, the Rays unlocked something in there. They... They did their little magic, and they uh, they turned him. He was so good. I mean, it was a pretty small sample, but it was enough of a sample to be like, holy shit, okay, this guy's like really good. Uh, and if you just watched him pitch, you could pick up on that. Like he was he was making dudes look silly. Like no one hit his like cutter slider, uh, which is, is weird because the cut, it's like eighty nine mile eighty nine mile an hour cutter, I think, or something like that. But no one could hit it. Uh, and then he whips out like a high nineties fastball to also just keep you off, <laughs> keep you off beat up there at the plate. Uh, he's really good for the Rays last year, and he goes to the Angels three years, thirty three million, good amount of money for a good reliever. I think. I mean, this is a good signing just in the in a vacuum. Like he's a good, 
appears to be a good reliever. The Angels need some more viable bullpen arms out there to help. They have a couple decent ones, but they they definitely could use more. And this solves a little bit of a late inning problem that they might have had. Um, it also is a good reminder that like while the Angels they they lost Otani, obviously that's huge. Uh, they're not dead. I mean, it's not like they were alive with Otani. They didn't make the playoffs. But they're not dead, and they're not going to just roll over and die. I don't think Paramanesian and even Artie Moreno, the owner, um, and the Pobo, respectively, Paramanesian, I don't think there's, they're not going to roll over and just accept their fate. I think they went all in. They have some young guys in the major league level that they promoted aggressively that they hope will take a step, and they still have Mike Trout, and they still have some other decent players, and I feel like they're still going to try to spend money and compete. As much as we laugh, and I laugh at the Angels and their incompetence, I think it's something to consider as a Mariners fan that, yes, you have a team like the A's who have some fun players, but ultimately they're not really trying to win. I think you have three of the other teams in this division trying to win. Two pretty competent teams in the Rangers and the Astros, and then the Angels, who are kind of this this wild card of they have some good players and baseball's random. And like, what if they make the playoffs the year after Otani leaves? Like, I'm not ruling that out. I'm not saying they will. Like this, this team still seems like a 75 win team solidly to me. Uh, but it's baseball, man. It's random as hell. Uh, and I, again, I don't think they're just going to roll over and die. I think they're going to actively try to, win baseball games next year. So this is a good reminder. It's a good signing. Bob Steve, I thought he'd go to a bigger contender, but hats off the Angels. And then the biggest signing news of the week, Josh Hader, known uh, unsavory human being. Josh Hader signs with the Houston Astros, a team that no one likes. It's a perfect pairing, really. Five years, $95 million. Huge contract for... A relief pitcher, but this is the day and age that we are in. I, I I would say overpay, you know. But uh, no, I think this is just the price you're gonna have to pay for the one of the best closers, if not the best closer in baseball of the past five years. Uh, he, I mean, don't just look at his ERA from last year. He had a really rough start to the season, and then the final like three months, he gave up like five runs total. Uh, he was so good for the Padres. He was a huge reason why they almost made the playoffs. The The team started to actually get leads uh, and give him the ball in save situations, and he was so, he was so good uh, down the stretch for them. Because uh, you can look at uh, – you can just look at what he did in uh, – or 2022, I meant, is what, is, what I'm, is what I meant from the Padres. He gets traded there. He's a terrible ERA. He had a bad ERA with the Brewers in 2022. He comes out – 2023 is dynamite makes another all-star team really good enters the free agency like maybe the perfect season to have going into free agency as the premier relief pitcher on the market and he goes to the astros for a large sum of money now do i want to be paying in five years that guy do i want to be paying him that much money per year Eh, maybe not but like again it's free agency they're gonna probably get at least two to three years out of him uh, of of primeness if he's still in his prime. I mean, it's it's still paying a reliever, and sometimes they just absolutely implode, and that's just what you're gonna get. But it's kind of fascinating that Houston saw like they lost a good amount of bullpen arms this year to Kendall Graveman hurt, and then they lost Phil Maton and Hector Neris just to free agency. I thought they might just resign one or both of them, but um. They throw a huge bag at Hayter, a guy who's a closer, and the Astros have two legitimately, like, legit closers on most contending teams in their bullpen already, in Ryan Presley and Brian Abreu. Uh, and you add Hayter into the mix, who's going to be their closer for sure. You don't pay a guy this much money and have him be the setup man. He's going to be the closer. That back-of-the-bullpen battery of a Brayu Presley hater is disgusting. Like that's genuinely sickening to me. That is I think it's I think it's the best back of the bullpen in, in baseball now, just on paper. Uh because Ryan Presley's been I feel like super 
underrated, it feels like. Like, no one really talks about how good Ryan Presley is. Maybe it's just because he's a reliever and casual fans don't pay as much attention, but he's super good. And then I think Brian Abreu is better. I think Brian Abreu is one of, he's been one of the best uh, relievers in baseball. And I mean, people saw that in that, in that uh, world series run in 2022. And now they have Josh Hader. (laughs) So I guess congratulations Astros. I mean, this sucks, man. I don't want to face those three guys as a Mariners fan. That that's brutal. Um, but I guess they're they're building on a strength. And this Astros team fascinating because I I don't want to list it for you. But if you don't know about how many players are potentially hitting free agency after the end of next season, and what their roster might look like in twenty twenty five. Wow, that's crazy to think about. But what their roster might look like in 2025 is crazy compared to what it is now and what we've noted as. I'd recommend just to go look. Or I think um, I think Michael Bauman at Fangraphs wrote an article uh, about that, I believe. Um, it's it's kind of crazy. On the topic of relievers, I'm done talking about every other team. Now it's time to talk about the Mariners for a hot second. They haven't done much, really, in the past like week, so I don't have much to talk about besides, you know, if they formed a basketball team and whatnot. But on the topic of relievers, Jerry DePoto and the Seattle Mariners are accumulating relievers in mass quantity, it feels like. I mean, every team signs minor league relievers, but it felt like they just kind of kept doing it, and they kept doing it. And it's it's snowballed to now. They have so many arms that they could potentially see pitching in this bullpen this season. So not only did they add arms via trade in uh, Carlos Vargas, who I briefly touched on the trade with the Diamondbacks. And then, I mean, they got Anthony Desclafani, and he's a starter, but I'm just going to talk about him as a reliever because I think he's just going to be the long man out of the bullpen uh, swing man. Maybe he'll start a couple times, but mainly um, reliever. And then in the last couple weeks, they've added like three or four other relievers, and I wanted to just talk about it a little bit. They added Kirby Sneed. They signed him to a minor league contract. He... That's a name. That's an all. That's a naming dudes type name. He is. Uh, I mean, he's been on a lot of teams. I feel like uh, Kirby Snead again. I mean, major league track record to a minor league deal. He'll pitch in Tacoma. I. I mean, I could potentially see him filling in in the bullpen for sure. Uh, they the next day after signing him and uh, Jonathan Diaz and Corey Abbott, both relief pitchers to minor league deals. I don't know much else to say about those two guys. They claimed Maurizio, I think it's Yovera, I believe, Yovera is how you pronounce his last name. They claimed him from Boston. Uh, I don't know much about him besides that. I mean, the numbers don't look great, but I think he, like, throws really hard. I think it's probably just something they're, like, going to take a flyer on and potentially fix him and have him as a depth arm. And then the next day, we confirmed that Topa and Thornton, Justin, and Trent both signed avoided arbitration that obviously we kind of knew they were going to be on the team next year, but arbitration-wise, I'm just going through the transaction list. And then in the last six six days, they have added reliever Joey Crable and Ty Buttry to minor league deals. Ty Buttry, I feel like people will know more than uh, Joey. I don't know how to say his name, man. Joey Crable. Joey Crable was on the Orioles uh, last few years. Um, I again, I I feel like it's just a guy who can come up and throw innings. Same with Ty Buttry. He's been on the Angels for a little while now, uh, and just not. I mean, nothing impressive about his numbers either. But that's just, I feel like they've essentially filled out their Tacoma bullpen roster. And then this is the one that I really wanted to talk about that it didn't shock me, but it surprised me. After all of these minor league contracts to relievers that aren't like super significant, I think to certain teams they are. I think when the Mariners sign a guy to a minor league deal, I have a lot more optimism about them turning him into a fine 
major league average middle relief pitcher out of the bullpen than a lot of other teams. I've talked about this before. So I think that's a strength, and I feel like that's that's good that they're just, you know, I think they're going to be enough viable options in Tacoma to get them the innings they need to finish the year. And then they signed Austin Voth, and I made an awful joke on Twitter about Austin Voth uh, and the and the Visigoths. Don't go look at it. It was a terrible joke. They signed him to a major league contract, a one-year major league contract, signed as a free agent. What? Why? I'm not I'm not shitting on Austin Voth. But I saw his name pop up and Mariners, like they signed him, and I was like, oh okay, cool. They signed another uh they signed another minor league relief pitcher to a minor league deal. No. No. I would be I was incorrect in my assumption. They signed Austin Voth to a major league contract, which is interesting to me. Um, not only because it gives them a little less flexibility in what they can do with him, particularly because if, let's say, he doesn't pan out like he might not, then you kind of just have to eat that money and, like, DFA him or waive him to either send him to AAA, trade him, release him. Like, it just gives you, I don't know, it gives you more pressure also to start him uh, on the major league team over guys who what if guys impress in in spring training and all of a sudden you're like "Hmm, i don't really want austin voth at the back of my bullpen now but he's on a major league contract it was just weird to me because i i don't know did he warn a major league contract i feel like no like who else was giving him a major league deal i maybe i'm too hung up on it it was just bizarre he he had a pretty solid season with the orioles in 2022 had a little bit of a drop off in 2023 uh, it was a pretty small sample, but like the peripheral numbers, pff, for the most part, backed up the raw numbers. So it wasn't like he just got supremely unlucky in those like 35 odd innings that he threw last year. But then the Mariners came out shortly after this, and they said they're going to try him as a as a starter in spring training and stretch him out, see what he can do as a starting pitcher, which made me even more confused. Because, what, like, what, it, doesn't that just confuse you kind of hearing it? Austin Voth, they're stretching him out to be a starter. This is not a team desperate for starting pitching. This is a team that already has six, seven viable starting pitchers. Six, if you want to say Emerson Hancock's a question mark. They added Anthony Descalfani through a trade, and he's presumably the depth sixth arm. And I, I like I understand Austin Voth trying to stretch him as a starter, just in terms of like starting pitching depth is gold in modern baseball. I don't think I've talked about this before. I don't think teams can ever have enough of it. So if Austin Voth can stick in the bullpen and be an emergency starter behind Descalfani, if it gets to that, hopefully it, it won't. But if it gets to that, then sure. Uh, but it's also just like, I don't know, it's just wacky. It's kind of just a wacky move, and I don't know what to make of it, and I don't have any predictions for it. So that is my take on Austin Voth. That was just, it was interesting. After so many minor league signings, they give Austin Voth a one-year major league deal. It was just bizarre to me, um, and I want to talk about it. But uh, maybe, maybe... It still is so poised. Everything is poised for them to trade a pitcher for a bat. Everything is pointing in that direction, and it keeps not happening. And I still I don't know if it is going to happen. I talked about this last week. I'm almost just like fine with them holding on to all of their arms now. I feel like this is good. I feel like this is a good amount of depth. They have seven starting pitchers and one Austin Voth. That's one more Austin Voth than every other team in baseball has. You got to think about it that way, actually. And now we're cooking. It, like everything is pointing in the direction of trading a pitcher, but maybe they just don't. Maybe they go with a six-man rotation because every pitcher was very healthy last year. For them, I mean, Robbie Ray and Marco were out for the year, but then you had two young guys come up and they were healthy most of the year. Bryce Miller had blisters for like two weeks. But your three horses, at least, they were healthy all year, which I'm, like, scared about because that is something 
that I'm worried they wasted by not making the playoffs. They wasted three very good pitchers, fully healthy seasons in the year of our Lord, 2023. Now it's 2024. Those guys are a year older with more miles on their arms. Are they going to pitch a full season? That worries me. So maybe you you roll out to start the year. Maybe you roll out a six-man. And you have uh, Emerson Hancock, Anthony Desclafani, Austin both Battery as the sixth man of the rotation here. And I don't hate it. Maybe that's what they do. I don't know. I, it's just interesting. The, the Voth signing was thought-provoking to me. Maybe it wasn't to most of you, but I saw a major league deal, and I was like, hmm, that's curious. Uh, very curious. And then just looking, that made me just look at the bullpen. Because I think the Mariners are poised, again, to have a good bullpen in 2024, like they have the past few years. I think Andres Munoz and Matt Brash and Justin Topa, fuck it, I'll throw Justin Topa in there. I, that's a very good three as your best arms of the bullpen. I think Matt Brash is underrated and one of the best relievers in baseball. And you have Andres Munoz, who has been a little hurt, but he's coming into next year fully healthy. And I think when he's on, he's, again, also one of the best relievers in baseball. And then you have this emergence of Justin Topa, who had such a good year last year. And you essentially had him and Matt Brash throw you, like, what, 140, 150 combined innings last year out of the bullpen with a combined 2-8 ERA? Uh, that's phenomenal. You have these three guys. It's a great, great bullpen. And then you have your two lefties, Tyler Saucedo and Gabe Spire, both put together good seasons from the bullpen last year. They weren't, like, amazing. Spire was amazing for a while and was still very pleasantly surprised after just a waiver claim. Tyler Saucedo, also a waiver claim, turned into a good pitcher. Both of those guys, I think, they've earned spots in the starting bullpen on opening day next year as the two lefties in the bullpen. I think that's very fair to say. And then you have Trent Thornton, I think is Trent Thornton and Austin Voth, I guess are your next two guys that you can include here uh, because they're on major league deals. Uh, Thornton, his stuff looked nasty last year. He was pretty good in, in the innings he threw. Um, he, I just remember him throwing some randomly high leverage innings last year and not looking great. But body of work, he was fun, He was good. And I think the stuff looked really good. Uh, just watching him pitch, I think it intrigued me for what he can do next year. And then Voth, again, I just talked about Voth. He's there. He exists. And then Anthony Discofani. This is the projected bullpen at Fangraphs from Roster Resource. It's those guys. Obviously, there's going to be more guys who throw innings out of the bullpen than that. And I think after Munoz, Brash, Topa, I think there's enough confidence in those next five guys to be like, okay, but I think there's also enough variance in bullpen arms that can happen. And I think looking at it league-wide, I think, again, that's three. I, there's not a lot of bullpens you have three better arms than that. But then after it, I think I think there's a little bit of thin. I think there's I think it could be better. But there's, then there's these wild cards. I think Carlos Vargas, the guy that they got from the D-backs trade, I think he, I think him and Prelander Baroa are, are your wild cards uh, next year. And I think they're spicy. They're spicy wild cards, personally. And I'm not going to get too much into previewing because that'll be for the preview episode. But Perlander Broa, I feel like, is going to have a really good year next year. I feel like he's poised to enter the bullpen and be solid all year for the team. I think there will be enough innings, like I've discussed, there will be enough innings for him. And I think his his stats in AA speak for themselves. We saw him briefly in a very – they handled him so weird last year. Uh, but we saw him briefly last year, uh, and I think his stuff – Definitely plays at the major league level. It's about corralling the stuff now, but I, I feel like he's poised to have a really big year. And then Carlos Vargas is another guy who his stuff is crazy. His stuff plus is like 120, if you know what that means. I, I feel like I've explained stuff plus before. Um, 
but it's just it's just Fangraphs. It's just the raw collection of their pitching arsenal put on a league wide scale where a hundred is average, much like OPS plus or WRC plus or ERA plus any of those. His stuff's crazy good. He throws like 100 mile an hour fat, like triple digit potential fastball with this. A baseball savant calls it a cutter, but if you watch it, you you could convince me that's a slider for sure. It's nasty, uh, and his stuff's crazy. He just walks guys like 20 percent of the time. It's it's a classic contemporary baseball reliever case of his stuff is crazy, but he doesn't know where it's going. So he's he is. He's the wild card of wild cards. If the Mariners manage to figure him out and get that walk rate down, I think he could legitimately be one of the best relievers in baseball. However, he could also fade away into nothingness because that's just how it works sometimes. And I think I think um, Lookout Landing compared him to Johan Ramirez. If you remember Johan Ramirez fondly, I do. That guy, electric stuff, crazy stuff, very promising when he first came up with the Mariners, too. His, his numbers looked good and then just absolutely faded away. Um, I think it's a great comp, and it's it's a poten- it's the potential with Carlos Vargas that's so intriguing. So I feel like those are your two wild cards, and then the rest of the arms are just kind of there. I feel like they have enough arms, um, and I'm not like worried about the bullpen, to be honest. I feel like because I follow the team so heavily, I'm more confident in the bullpen because if I just looked at those top three that I mentioned, I'd be like, yeah, that's sick. And then if I looked at the rest of the names, I'd be like, oh, I don't know about that. But as like a Mariners fan who watched most of those guys last year, I'm like pretty confident. I'm pretty confident they have enough going on. And then they have enough like of the wild cards. I feel like for a good bullpen in this day and age, you kind of need those guys to be like, what if? Because what if they do? Even if they're not a great reliever for the rest of their career, what if Carlos Vargas comes up and lights the world on fire next season, and then fades in, in 2025. He still lit the world on fire the next season. Like, there's, you still have that. It could potentially happen. It's fun. It's fun. You kind of need that. Um, and then Ed, uh, Edward Bizardo, too. I, f- I tweeted about him last year when he pitched. I just really liked him. I just really liked the, the stuff. I liked the way he pitched. Uh, he looked pretty good in, in the little that he pitched for the team. And, like, it was, you know, he, he got the low leverage innings so there's more to learn about him but i really i liked him a lot i was drawn to edward bizardo uh and i feel like we could see more of him next year because he 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 intrigued me he intrigued me greatly and that's my rant on the manager's bullpen it really that <clears throat> the signings and then particularly the austin Voth signing really just got me worked up to to look at the bullpen a little earlier in the off season than I would have liked to try to talk about the bullpen for the whole season. But that was what the Mariners have been doing with, the, with relievers. Um, Austin Voth, congratulations. You're on a major league contract. So as bizarre as it is, that's a thing. Segway into the off season as a whole. Before I talk about the Mariners basketball team, there's plenty of uh, online discourse last week of like who has had the worst off season, the best off season, you know, it's it's the big accounts in the sport you follow tweeting like who's had blank, what's been blank to get a bunch of engagement, which I don't have a problem with. Uh but fun stuff comes out of it. And I just got to thinking, what team has had the worst off season? And I know the answer. Um but like I think like the Mariners have been disappointing, but I wouldn't say it's been the worst. You know, I feel like they've added good players. They've gotten rid of good players too, and they could be doing so much more. They could have done so much more, but I wouldn't say it's been the worst off season. I think the Padres is definitely in that conversation. It's an L. I mean, they've they've got a lot of pitching depth now. They've signed some good bullpen arms, and they got a lot back in the Grisham Soto deal, pitching wise in an attempt to fill the hater size hole that was left and the Snell size hole and and Nick Martinez also. Like, they had a lot of pitching to replace. And I feel like they've done it in a fine job. I think they have more to do. But it's an automatic 
bad off season if you trade Juan Soto for me. I think that automatically puts you in this category, in my opinion. So they're in here. I think the Twins, even like the Twins, you could see as a as a d- disappointing slash bad off season. Like they haven't really done anything. They lost Sonny Gray and Kent Maeda, and they haven't really done much. Like the Angels, they lost Otani, so that's an automatic L for me there in this conversation. I think the Rays, uh, I feel like their moves have been fine, but with all the Wander stuff going on, not that they were responsible for that, obviously, but that's just not good. Not good at all. Not a good offseason given the circumstances of him likely never playing for them or in Major League Baseball ever again. I think that also puts them in the worst offseason. That's like the just, it's the worst offseason of what they couldn't control. I mean, that is the worst. But I think the worst, I I think the worst off seasons are all in the AL East. I think the Orioles have had the worst off season. I think it's been the most disappointing and the worst. They've done nothing. They have so much money to spend. They have this team full of prospects who either are still rising through the ranks and getting ranked in the top 100, or they hit the majors in the last year or two and are looking really promising. They have more hitting prospects than they have spots in their roster to play them. And they haven't even traded any of them. If they have made a couple trades this offseason to get better, I don't think I'd be having this conversation, but they haven't signed nor really traded anything significant at all particularly because it's a strong pitching market for agency wise. It was a very strong pitching market, not a very good hitters market, but guess what the Orioles didn't need hitters. They have some good pitching. They have some good pitching on their team. All right. And they have Grayson Rodriguez who emerged late after getting sent back down last year. And he's clearly on the up and up, and he showed why he was a top prospect in baseball. They have Dean Kremer, who put together a very solid, solid year last year. They have Kyle Bradish, who put together a great year last year. They have John Means coming back from injury. Don't know what to make of him. They have... Uh, some solid bullpen arms, you know, they have such, they're building on a season where they won. What did they win? 102 games last year. And what have they done? They have signed Craig Kimbrell. Sure. Crickets. <clears throat> Craig Kimbrell. That is reprehensible to me. I, if I was a fan of the Orioles, I would be absolutely livid. You win 101 games. Your roster is so... You, the pitching market. The pitching market, guys. Think about the pitching market. Think about the pitching market that still exists right now compared to what it was at the start of the offseason. There's still so many pitchers left. I even, even after a good amount of them have signed, they're still... so They, they could end up having a good offseason, but they've done... Nothing, and that's why I think they have had the worst offseason. Now, if they go out and they sign Jordan Montgomery or Blake Snell, you know, then sure. Then I'll give them a little bit of a pat on the back, even though just signing one of those guys would, I don't think, be enough. But that, I think, is why they've had the worst offseason. And the other two, I think the Red Sox and the Blue Jays are right behind them. To be honest, I think the Red Sox and the Blue Jays are right behind them. The Red Sox fired Bloom. They hired a new Popo. They come out. They say, full throttle. We're going full throttle here. They've traded for Von Grissom, which I like that trade for them. And they traded for Tyler O'Neill. And they signed Lucas Giolito. That's it. That's not full throttle. They hired a GM to presumably sign for agents and build a winning team which the narrative, as Haim was on the way out, was mm, that guy, you know, he just clearly didn't go for it. He didn't want to go for it. And they bring in a new GM, and ho-hum, 
he sounds exactly like Haim in these in these uh, media opportunities. Whenever I hear Breslow speak, it's like you could put it out of Haim Bloom's mouth, and I would believe you. They're saying the same things, which obviously means ownership is maybe ownership's a little bit more focused on the Premier League title chase with Liverpool right now. I don't know, man. Maybe they don't want to put as much money into the Red Sox as Liverpool. I don't know. I don't know. Just just saying. It's been disappointing. And the Blue Jays. I think the Blue Jays, I'm putting in that category because, I mean, they've had a pretty underwhelming offseason, and a lot of their 2024 goals are going to be determined based on players they already have on their team. But I think just because of the Otani stuff that happened, I'm putting them in the worst offseason. I think in terms of vibes, maybe the worst. I mean, maybe the worst just after the uh, Otani plane fiasco that happened. And the best. Who's had the best offseason? Dodgers, clearly. Dodgers are number one. Let's discount them. They have had the best offseason. It's not close. Who's had the second best offseason? Uh, I think the Yankees have had a very solid offseason. They added Soto, Stroman, Verdugo. Oh, Trent Grisham as well. I think it's been a, a solid offseason for them. Uh, the D-backs, I feel like, have had a good offseason. They re-signed Lourdes Gurriel. They signed Eduardo Rodriguez. They traded for Eugenio Suarez. I feel like they've had just a, a solid off season. Uh, the Royals, even not a bad off season, honestly. The Royals have had a fine off season. Uh, I think. I mean, who else? Who else has had a good? I feel like there's not a lot of teams that have had a good off season because the off season is really not that close to being over. Uh, in terms of like, it it is like on the calendar. There's really like a month and some change after that left before pitchers and catchers report. But there's so many unsigned guys, it's hard to be like, oh, this is a failure of an offseason for you because there's just so much potential out there. But I like the Reds in this category. I mean, they signed Jaime Candelario, Nick Martinez, uh, Frankie Montas, uh, I think Emilio Pagan they signed. I feel like they've done a good job. I feel like the Giants have had a decent offseason. The Phillies, I, I guess. I mean, they, they re-signed Aaron Nola. That's a, that's a W. The, the Cardinals, kind of. I mean, the Cardinals just... And no, they just signed Matt Carpenter to a major league deal, so I'm not going to put them in this category. They're in the gray area of this. They signed a bunch of old guys. But then also Sonny Gray, so that's a dub. Atlanta, they've had a bizarre... Off season, kind of, but I'd ra- I'd probably lean good off season rather than bad. I don't know. I think there's just a lot more examples of bad off season, but I think my answer is here. Dodgers have had the best off season. After that, I think the Yankees, who's at the worst, I think is the Orioles. Uh, and I I would have thrown the Cubs in this category, but they signed Imanaga, so I think that puts them a little bit above these other worst teams. But yeah, that's my take on who's had the best and worst off seasons. Now, it's time. It's time to draft up a Major League Baseball NBA roster. Now, I've thought about this. I think about this a lot, about what sports teams would be good at other sports, and I don't know. I mean, they wouldn't be good because the height difference between the like NBA, even college, and like baseball players is a lot. Baseball players are taller than you might than a lot of people think. But I have a lineup, a five-guy lineup, point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, and center, and then sixth man. And I have six players currently on the major league roster for the Seattle Mariners. I went off the 40-man. These are all these are six guys that you, you know and are on the major league roster. But I thought about, like, Lazaro Montez for a second. And I was like, no, I'm not going to include it. I'm not going to go minor leaguers because Lazaro I might have put on this team, to be honest. But I didn't. I didn't. Even like Harry Ford, he's athletic as hell. I might have put him on it. Uh, But no, I didn't. I went MLB, 40-man roster, and then I gave comps. I gave NBA comps for these guys. And I want you to take these comps with the smallest grain of salt possible. I'm going more with style of play and vibe comp rather than like... Because, you know, comping these guys, it's like these, you know... Uh, they're like six inches taller than all these baseball players. It's hard to make a comp, like body wise. But more and more, this is play style comp, and just kind of vibes. A lot of this is just vibes. 
And I'll start. Where should I start? I'll start. I'll start with point guard. I'll start with the Mariners' point guard. Who is the Mariners' point guard? Who is the floor general for the Seattle Mariners? Who's going to bring the ball up up the floor, run plays, but but is a modern point guard? You know, it's not just a facilitator. He's got to be a scorer. He's got to probably shoot the three, like a lot of point guards tend to do these days in the modern NBA. And the point guard of the Mariners team, when you really think about it, I think it can only really be one man, and that's George Kirby. I think George Kirby, I think his command on the mound lends itself very nicely to dish in the rock. And George Kirby's NBA comp, I think, is Tyrese Halliburton. Because Tyrese Halliburton, I love Tyrese Halliburton, by the way. I love Tyrese Halliburton almost as much as I love George Kirby. But Tyrese Halliburton, a man who not only is one of the best three-point shooters in the league, but he also just does not really turn the ball over and averages like 11 assists a game. I think that's the perfect comp for George Kirby. That's the point guard. Now, shooting guard. Who would be the shooting guard on the Seattle Mariners? The shooting guard for this team is John Paul Crawford. Oh, I should say, George Kirby is 6'4". I'm just going to say that. George Kirby is listed at 6'4", 215. So that's honestly like point guard height, if we if we think about it. That's point guard height. It's like That's like taller than Steph Curry. Now, the shooting guard is J.P. Crawford. J.P. is 6'2", 202. So again, that's like guard height. That's a, that's a backcourt that is not really that undersized, if you really think about it. But J.P. Crawford is the shooting guard, and he's not hes not an offense-only shooting guard. I was trying to build a well-balanced team, and I think J.P. would give you a nice— I think he'd be a nice, just he'll shoot the three on the offensive side. I think he'd be a 35 to 38% three-point shooter. I think he'd be an offensive contributor. But then I think he'd also just be a dog on defense. And his NBA comp, and bear with me here, is Derek White of the Boston Celtics. Now, Derek White, I think, is nationally underrated. Derek White, two-way, one of the better two-way guards in the league right now. Yeah, I'll say it. And I feel like he's he's the glue that holds that starting five together. I mean, you have Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and Chris House Porzingis. You have these stars. And then you have Derek White. I think Derek White holds it all together. I think he does the dirty work. I think he's a silent leader of the team. That's J.P. Crawford to me. Moving on to small forward, there's only one choice here, again, like the point guard for me. There was only one choice of small forward, the superstar of the Seattle Mariners, baseball and basketball team, it's Julio Rodriguez. Now, Julio is 6'3", 228. Now, for small forward in the NBA, that's undersized for sure, but that's fine. He'll make up for it in pure athleticism and skill. I think he's just, uh, like he is in baseball, I think he's an all-around great player, MVP caliber type player, uh, a really good two-way small forward, a guy who is just the definition of a modern NBA wing, and that's why his comp is Paul George. I think I think Paul George is a good comp for Julio Rodriguez, and I think he's, I think he, he's the talisman of this basketball team. I mean, George Kirby passing Julio Rodriguez the rock with JP in the corner, that's that's a good start. And I think I think he's a dog on defense too. Like he it's like in in baseball. He's he does everything well. I think he's just a really polished forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now the power forward. Now this also just makes a lot of sense in my mind. It's Cal Raleigh. It's Big Dumper and Cal Raleigh is he's a big boy. There's talk recently of the dumper disappearing. There's a video on Twitter. I don't believe it. I think I think that video was edited. That was doctored. I don't. I won't believe it till I see it. But Cal is 6'3", 235 again. The the forward and center positions are just undersized for <clears throat> the NBA. Uh, but you know that's a that's a big boy. He's gonna be throwing that ass around. Not. I don't see Cal as a three point shooter as much as he hits home runs. I don't think he's a three point shooter at all. I think he's gonna shine with his lower center of gravity, ball control, and just general uh, throwing that ass around and just moving guys out of the way with pure um, ass. 
And so that's why I think his comp is Zion Williamson. Now, Zion's a phenomenal athlete, but he also lives in New Orleans and is a big boy. And I feel like he like Zion doesn't really shoot threes, and I feel like Cal would play just like Zion. I think he'd just play pure bully ball and finish at the rim. Uh, and so I think that's a good comp. Cal Raleigh is a power forward. Now, center. Center, I also think there's really only one choice here. And I think it's Logan Gilbert. I think the center has to be Logan Gilbert. He's 6'6", 215, undersized center, but that's he's tall and lanky. So I feel like as a center on this team, he'll get the job done. Now, Logan is an all-around pitcher. He's a workhorse. I think I think he would, as much as Cal would be like in more old school, Zion Williamson, you know, Charles Barkley type power forward and old style, I think Logan Gilbert would embody the modern NBA center. I think he would shoot threes. I think he'd play solid defense. I think he'd be a decent facilitator. I think he'd be quick on his feet. And I think his NBA comp is Chet Holmgren. Goes to X, by the way. Chet Holmgren. I mean, just in terms of body type, obviously Chet is like 7'1". Logan Gilbert's 6'6", and very lanky. And so I feel like the body type kind of fits correctly. And I think like Logan would be a good shot blocker with his lank. Uh, but also, again, I think he'd have a decent stroke from the three-point line. So, Chow Holmgren is going to be a comp for the center of this team, Logan Gilbert. <clears throat> and now, sixth man, the last part of this team, sixth man. I'm thinking I'm thinking of a, of, of a baseball player who's scrappy, who who gets dirty for the team, who hustles constantly, who maybe doesn't, get all the praise maybe some fans love him but he's he's forgettable to a lot of other people but he's he's in many ways the heart and soul of the bench or the dugout much like the sixth man and he lifts the team up when he comes in he doesn't play every day he's not an everyday starter so he's a utility man and his name's sam haggerty sam haggerty i think is the sixth man of this basketball team now, Sam Haggerty is 5'11", 175. Sounds like me. Small. That is that is not that big for an NBA player. But he's a sixth man. He's a scorer. I can. I, there's some of the best six men in history. Lou Williams, Jamal Crawford, they're not very tall. They're just saucy. They're coming off the bench. They're providing a spark. They're providing hustle. And they're scoring the rock. And I think Sam Haggerty could do that. And I think his NBA comp is Tyler Hero. Tyler Hero is the sixth man of the Miami Heat in many ways that Sam Haggerty is the sixth man of the Seattle Mariners. Now, that that doesn't really track that much, really. Tyler Hero should probably be a starter. But I think it's a good comp. I feel like Sam Haggerty, again, I don't, I don't think he'd offer much on the defensive end, but I think he could score, and I think he'd absolutely come off the bench for this team. And so that's my team. George Kirby at point, J.P. Crawford at shooting guard, Julio Rodriguez at small forward, Cal Raleigh at power forward, Logan Gilbert at center, and Sam Haggerty as your sixth man off the bench. And that is your Seattle Mariners baseball team. And that is the Chaos Ball Podcast, everyone. Thank you for listening thus far. Would this basketball team win more games than the Detroit Pistons? It's hard to know. It's hard to tell. Yes, yes, they would. Um, but maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. I don't know. But that's it for this podcast. I appreciate you listening. If you're listening to this right now, you listen all the way through, and I appreciate it so much. I, I wish I could give you a big kiss on the forehead. But in the form of a kiss on the forehead, you could give me a kiss on the forehead and rate the podcast and review it if you really feel inclined or tell your friends. But really, appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Will there be an episode next week? Again, depends on what happens. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Uh, we're rolling with the off season, but we are getting dangerously close to team preview uh, or divisional preview season. To be honest with you, I gotta start thinking about that. So uh, we're we're getting through the off season. There's still so many signings left to happen. Really intriguing, but we'll see where this takes us. Either way, I will see you next time and have a good rest of your day.